How often do you think about basketball? How often does that well, actually every come day up? now, every day, because my daughter is playing and I coach, so I coach her team, so we practice every day, and so. Okay. Um, are you running the triangle? We are. We are. We you are running the triangle. We absolutely are, and they execute it beautifully. No kidding. Beautifully. I, I was messing with Phil. So the first okay. time we ran the triangle, right? We ran a center opposite action, mm -hmm. and he ran it beautifully. Got a beautiful open three, knocked it down. So uh -huh. I sent the video to Phil. Phil was like. Does that center opposite? They actually mm -hmm. ran it. And I said, yes, because they got a better coach. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like it. He just thought how, he was awesome. How old are they now? 12. So they're 12. So you're 12. running with 12 year olds. Yeah. Are you giving them reading material for 12 year olds? No, no. Are you just, doing that film? What, I, what, I, what I've learned is like, I've, um, it's you have to think clearly in how you teach it. You just go piece by piece. Like, it's my responsibility to try to teach them the game and teaching the fundamentals of the game most importantly, right? Passing mm -hmm. with the left hand, right? understand spacing, being able to shoot the ball properly, finish at the rim properly, just basics, right? Instead of throwing them everything at once, you just break it up month to month. So are you, do you find yourself using Phil-isms with the kids? Like, I, you know, I do. But I started doing that even later in my career. Um, you know, a lot of his philosophies, a lot of things that he's taught me um, have really shaped who I am, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why I think he's the greatest coach because he impacted me not just from a basketball perspective, but you know as a person too. So give me an example. What is he? What is he left with? The patience. I mean, you remember me when I was younger. It was like, yo, do this, do it now. Let's go. Why right. aren't you getting this? Come right. on, let's go. Right. As opposed to now sitting back and allowing things to materialize and allowing um, people and uh, to develop and find their own way mm -hmm. and be there simply as a guiding force which helps me a lot in the coaching of my, my kids' team, uh, helps me in storytelling a lot as well. For the podcast of what you got out there now, you're talking yes. about like when, when the stories are written for these children's podcasts, the punies, you're, are you going over the copy? Are you like actually looking through what's being well, written? Yeah, so like what I, what I did is, um, when the idea of the show first came to me, I had the two characters already created, which was Puny Pete and Bibi LaBelle. Mm -hmm. And I had written 10 short stories for them. And my idea was to have them have individual uh, picture books with short stories. Um, but then we have a family tradition. We watch The Sandlot every 4th of July. And, uh, the Sandlot, the Sandlot every 4th every of, of July. We watch The Sandlot as a family. And after watching The Sandlot, I was like, man, we need more movies like this, you know, for kids. It's just in a park and having fun. Uh -huh. So I started kind of coming up with ideas and concepts and nothing really stuck. Um, and then in Thanksgiving, our other tradition is watching The Peanuts, you know, Thanksgiving special. Sure, right. And so when I was watching that, it, those two things just came together for me. It was like, huh, I got it. Puny Pete, BB LaBelle come together. This is going to be, you know, I'm going to mix the Sandlot and the, Puny, and, uh, and the Peanuts and create our own series. Well, it's interesting, you know, listening to uh, some of the episodes of this podcast, the opening theme, when I heard it, it sounded like the Peanuts theme. Yeah, is that on our, purpose? That's our homage. Um, to the Peanuts and Schultz and what they, what they were able to create. And I feel like in this day and age for children, the music is, is very is very pop. You know, there's all, there's all, all of that. There, there's no classic music anymore mm -hmm. of strong piano themes and strong uh, melody themes. And so we wanted to kind of go back to, way, to the way shows used to be. So when it all comes down to it, um, you want to do what with your second career here well, at Kobe? We, you know, what we want to do is use sports as the greatest metaphor for life. And if we feel, we feel like if we can teach kids how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with pressure, how to deal with failure, how to deal with success through sport, then it in turn it helps them to become better people, right? So like if you're struggling with something, if your kid's struggling with a bully at school, or struggling with taking tests because the pressure is just too much. How do you practice that? Like as a, as a, as a father, you, you can go to your, your daughter and your son and say, okay, you know, work your hardest, um, don't worry about the end result. But those are just words, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Right? They have to physically put themselves, emotionally put themselves in that same situation over and over to really be able to understand how to deal with it. And what we're saying is that sports does that for you. So now through sport, when you practice every day and you're playing these games and you have these emotional challenges, you get used to figuring out how to navigate yourself through, which in turn helps you to become a better test taker and vice versa. I had Jeannie Buss on my show last week. She said that you sent her um, a text when LeBron 
came to the Lakers yeah. of her as the mother of dragons. You sent her a Khaleesi, a Khaleesi photograph <laughs> to did. her phone. I did, I did. What was your intention on I that? I did. I sent her a, <laughs> a gif of Khaleesi riding in on thousand ships behind her with uh, Tyrion next to her and everybody right. next to her. So I said, this is what you are. I mean, when I spoke to her about making her decision, I told her, I said, at some point, Jeannie, you have to become Khaleesi. You gotta be the mother of dragons. The decision you claim. With, her, with her family yeah, you're talking yeah, about? You gotta claim what is rightfully yours and go for it, man. So I, I felt like that was appropriate to send her that, that gift. Well, she's, now she kind of <laughs> does sit on that iron throne, I guess, to use yeah. that phrase, yeah. with LeBron coming here. Uh, what is your relationship with LeBron? I oh. talked to him the, the day um, it was announced. I talked to him and just reached out to him and said, welcome to LA. And I said, now you're a part of the family. So if you ever need anything whatsoever, just you know where to find me, man. I'm right here, and uh, it's excited for him. Are you aware that there are some of your diehard fans that have an issue with LeBron being termed as part of the family? Kobe? Yeah, I, I hear that, but it, you know, listen, if you're a fan of mine, you're a fan of winning. You're a fan of the Lakers, right? I bleed purple and gold, so that's above anything else. I've been a Laker fan since I was yay high. Mm -hmm. That's never going to change, right? And uh, we're about winning championships, so they'll, they'll fall in line. What do you think um, he needs to accomplish here in order to be viewed in a similar vein as, say, you as a Laker, Kobe? Well, I don't know. The making the comparisons of <clears throat> him being viewed in a similar vein as me, I mean, that doesn't make much sense, right? I mean, I, you know, I think the goal is always to win championships. No matter where you go, that's the goal. And that's his goal. That's Rob's goal, that's Magic's goal, that's Jeannie's goal, Rondo, all the guys, Kuzma, Lonzo, they all want to win championships, man. So that's what they're gunning for. So he he needs to win a championship here in LA? Why do people, do why do people always say that? They say, okay, well, you need to win. And then then there's this this like crowd of people that are like, well, you don't need to win a championship. Well, you're asking me, we have to win championships. This is why we play, this is why we're here, is to mm -hmm. win championships. And you know, he wouldn't have came here if he he didn't expect to win championships. Well, I mean, I'm of the mindset that his legacy as one of the all-time greats is already sealed. Yeah. I mean, that that's well, kind of, he's already done that. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, would agree, you would agree with that assessment, yeah. obviously, right? Yeah. So now he's coming to Los Angeles, and in a way, he's trying to next level achieve with something you already have, which is Laker championships, plural, and maybe an Oscar in the trophy case yeah. also. Well, it's, to me, it's just really simple. Wherever you play, the object is to win championships. That's it. End of story. End of story. Professional basketball, how often do you think about that these days? Uh, I mean, every so often, but not, not much. I mean, I think about it for, um, you know, a lot of the players reach out and they want to come out and work out and do some things like that. So I have guys come down and, and I'll work with them. Who's come? Who's been? Jason's, been, Jason's been down. Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum's been down. Uh, Kuzma's been down. I uh, have a couple more on the books coming down later in the summer. What do you do with them? What do you do um, with these guys? Well, you know, the first thing to do is self-assess. Like, what do you feel comfortable doing on the court? What do you don't feel comfortable doing? I mean, it starts with that. You got to be able to look inside and say, okay, your know, coaches can only tell you but so much. You know what you can and can't do, and you have to be honest about it. And so once we get to that, then it's okay, well, let's put you through it. How does Kuzma look to you? Dude, he looks great, man. He looks great. He's got good rhythm. Um, he has the ability to disassociate movements, mm -hmm. right, which gives him a fluidity when he plays. Um, but he can shoot the ball. He's worked on his mid-range game, game a lot. Post-up game looks strong. So looking forward to him having a good year, man. How often do you give your thoughts on the current Laker roster to, say, your former agent? Every, every time Rob calls me. Okay. <laughs> you, you offer something up to him? Well, yeah. I mean, look, Rob and I have been friends forever. I mean, mm -hmm. he's godfather to Gianna. And, um, so we'll, we'll talk, man. And I'll, sometimes I'll call just to check him and see how he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, because like, you know, when I played during the season, he'd have to pick up for me with my family. Because I'd miss, for example, Halloween, Christmas. Sure. And so he'd go out with my family and stuff. And when so, he was your agent? When he was my agent. And okay. so now it's just kind of reverse. So when he's out on the road, I'll spend time with his family and take him out trick-or-treating and all that good stuff. What do you think of Rondo's uh, presence here with Lonzo Ball and him? Is there, you think, a competition in the backcourt? No, I think there's a lot to be learned from. I mean, Rondo's a student of the game. How he studies the game, I think mm -hmm. it's something that Lonzo can learn from. You know, you know, Rondo will sit there and watch film for hours and hours and hours and hours and dissect and pick things apart to the smallest of detail. 
And I think it's important for Lonzo to see that. Also, how he facilitates the game, how he reads things happening before they actually happen, how you can manipulate the defense to make things happen. And also, defensively, he gets after you. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great. When I spoke to Jeannie, she said that she would have you do anything you'd like for the Lakers franchise. Has she communicated that to you? Yeah. Okay, she has. Yeah. Uh, even a rumor that you might consider even maybe coming out of retirement <laughs> to play <laughs> one more time for the Lakers. Right. I see you're laughing. Yeah. There's nothing to that, right? There's about a 0% chance that I come back and play. So not even like a? Nothing. Zero. You're toast. You're finished. Done. As a player. That's it. Did last year at any point with you going through your first season not yeah. playing basketball? Never. Not once did you Never. think about it? Never. Here's the thing is for us athletes, it's really hard to transition from that, right? And I was really personal about it when I wrote Dear Basketball. But that is the true challenge of finding what comes next and finding something that you love to do every bit as much as you love your first passion. That is a challenge for us. And I think. Unfortunately for us athletes, we've been pigeonholed into thinking that we can only be one thing. And so when I retire and everybody is saying, okay, he's too competitive, he's not going to know what to do with himself. He's going to have to come back. I took that as a personal challenge of them thinking I'm this one-dimensional person that all I know is how to dribble a ball, shoot the ball, and play basketball and compete at that level. And so I took that as a personal challenge. I will never come back to the game, ever. I'm here to show people that we can do much more than that. And creating this business, winning an Oscar, winning the Emmy and the Annie, those are things that are showing other athletes that come after, no, no, there's more to this thing, right? So I would never, it's not even a, not even a thought. So the, the goal was an EGOT? You want the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, no, the you know, Tony? The, the, challenge, I mean, that... the challenge became, how do I take the lessons that I learned through the game of basketball and translate them into building the studio, right? What are the things that I can take from that? The discipline, um, the commitment, uh, the team and community, how do you get the best out of each other? How do I take those lessons and move those here? Um, that is the challenge. How do we do great work, uncompromising great work? You're not looking at the bottom line. You're focused on the product first, right? Is this the best thing that we can possibly make, no matter what? And having that sharp focus is something that I got from the game of basketball. So then how, what, podcasts, I mean, how for children? What, how do you choose your projects? How, how does that process go for you? Well, I, I just, uh, you know, I'll sit and I'll think and I'll create. You know, I, I write them all out um, and uh, create the characters, create the rules, the structure. Um, and, and then you kind of got to go with your gut. You got to go with your gut and see, are we creating something that's been done before? Or is this a project, something that nobody's seen before? Mm -hmm. And uh, is it a project that we're not sure that we can do? And if the answer is yes, then nine times out of 10, we're going for that one, right? Because that means we're pushing boundaries a little bit. Um, so that's how I generally pick them. Do you ever want to act? No, no. I, I love creating. I love creating, I love directing, I love producing. I don't love acting. I don't love being in front of the camera. I like trying to figure out if the arc of the story is the right one. <laughs> sure. Are you taking pitches? No. You don't take pitches? Nope. Nobody's pitching Kobe Bryant a story. No, we don't take pitches. Like we're 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 a very focused company. Like we have our projects that slayed out five years. We know exactly what we're releasing from now to five years from now, and when we're releasing them, and how they have a domino effect from books to film to you know, Broadway. We have very specific goals huh. and things that we want to accomplish. So we're very very focused on those, and all the projects are created in house. So coming to you with my dear TV idea, that's that's out. That's not happening. I mean, if I ever need for you to write well, TV Well, you kind of just slipped it in there right now, so I'll take that as a pitch. Well, I mean, no, it's just, I'm not done with my career. You gotcha. know what I'm saying? At some point. Dear TV. Know, dear TV. Listen, I, I can always, you know, dust off it's the okay pen. It's okay if you don't like it, Kobe. It's, it's fine, fine. Brother, listen, I can handle it. I can, I can dust it. off the pen and edit it for you. You write it, send it to me, I'll, I'll edit send it, it for oh, you. You'll, you'll, I will you'll absolutely. red notes, you'll circle. I will. Okay. And in I the will. meantime, you're just going to be coaching. I'll be like, this one. <laughs> this one's <laughs> that one's real. No, I'm just wow! Kidding. I feel now I'm, I'm getting the sense of understanding. You said you're more patient now. What happened to the patience, Kobe? No, what I'm happened? saying it in my head as I'm editing it. This uh, one, oh, when I, I give it back okay. to you. I'll go. You know, I think <laughs> there's another level that you can reach. Okay, wouldn't you agree? Well, yes, I, I agree with that. See, is that so how it would let, go? Let's, let's, got it. let's focus on being our best self. Okay, and yeah. then in the meantime, you're just going to coach. You're coaching your daughters. Yeah, I am. 
fantastic. Yeah, it's and, fun, man. And that's what, twice a week, three times a week? Is that what it no, is? No, every day. Every day. Every day. Is there a uh, a, a Lavar type parent that you're dealing with? No, or, for, no. Fortunately, no. all of our parents are very patient and just kind of hands okay. off with their children. No one's just... gonna just take their kids to Lithuania. On no, you? no, no, Is that no, happening? no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Not yet. Hey, Kobe. Thank you very much. <laughs> you got it. Appreciate man. it. Good to see you. Thank you, Kobe Bryant, here thank on the Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.